that Canada has given us in terms of setting up a rare disease drug strategy to say what we really need to have is an investment in a rare disease strategy, a rare disease program. And really what we've come around to saying is that what we want to do is we want to set up a smart rare disease system. We want to set up a smart rare drug strategy. And I think as you, many of you will know, what we want to rely on is being able to do a real pivot from where we are now to taking best advantages of how do we end up with best practices, state of the art. So next slide, and. So just briefly, only because um, some of you might be a little bit new to our webinars, um, this is in fact, um, our. we've been in our spring series of webinars, and I think this is webinar four for the spring. And we have been, you know, kind of doing webinars for the last two years. And some of you like Cheryl and Leanne and others, we've dragged into many of these and they have really contributed tremendously towards the development of these, including, um, you know, Terry and Chris and Etienne and others of you, we may not have had as directly involved. But what we want to be able to do is make sure, number one, that the commitment of $500 million a year or a billion dollars to set it up, starting in 2022 is in fact going to be honored this year and we want to make sure though that it's going to be invested wisely we don't just want to say okay government has made a commitment let's just see how we can kind of put some of those monies out there to fulfill a political promise but to make sure that we're using this as the beginning of setting up a real rare disease program in canada and i think what we also want to make sure <clears throat> though is that we understand and I think this is saying not so much for the people that are within our centers, but the, for everybody else involved, including the patients, that what we want to do is to make sure we're doing this smartly and that we're investing where it counts. Next slide. So, I mean, I think I'm going to have Etienne speak to a little bit later around some of the statistics around it, and many of you already know this, but what we do know, of course, is that you know, rare disease is not just a esoteric issue. What we have come to really realize, of course, is that it is an, a major public health issue that affects many, many Canadians. Obviously, many of them are children. And sadly, as we say, 30% of those children that are affected will not live to their fifth birthday. And I really give thanks to Etienne for really substantiating the statistics that a child dies of a rare disease every 18 minutes in Canada. That's pretty stunning when we think about it, and yet we don't have the investment in a strategy. So what we want to know is that how we can absolutely make sure that we're able to invest wisely. In terms of economic impact, if we look at the extrapolations, rare disease costs the Canadian economy about $111 billion a year in direct medical costs, non-medical costs, and productivity costs. This is a stunning number. And again, if it were any other condition, if in fact it were COVID, you know, we would have taken a very different tact. But because you know, it is an area of rare disease, small patient numbers on an individual basis, we have not been able to address it systematically. That's why it's so important for us coming together. Next slide. So why is the time now for a rare, smart, a rare disease smart drug strategy? And I think what we all know and what has been the impetus we think from the government's point of view, of course, is that there have been increasingly innovative therapies. And what we know about these innovative therapies is that many of them on an individual basis are absolutely very highly, highly effective, but also require a great deal in terms of being able to manage them to be able to make sure that they're actually able to deliver on the outcomes. And I think many of you will know, they're oftentimes coming to regulatory approval, coming to the market with you know, um, clinical trial data that are not at the same kind of comprehensiveness as we are used to in terms of more common drugs. We also know that many of them come in with individual prices that are quite high relative to much more common drugs. And even though many of them are now increasingly cell gene therapies that have what we would call lifetime benefits, they're still very challenging on an individual basis. And of course, what we know and what we look forward to and what um, maybe others that are looking on the pain and are concerned about is that many more are coming. 
So this is really the challenge that we've got. We've got more and more of these highly innovative, very effective, but drugs coming in with high uncertainty, oftentimes approved because there are no other therapies because we have patients that have you know, not only unmet needs, meet unmet needs, but are also, you know, um, you know, with very uh, progressive diseases that require intervention as soon as possible, we're trying to get them to patients as soon as possible. But we're also very concerned that we get them to the right patients, that they do work, and that over the long term, they're actually able to be sustainable. This is a hugely challenging, you know, situation for all of us, certainly more challenging and complex than probably in the other disease area. So we understand that there are lots of interests at stake here. But the question is, how do we actually do that? What we do know is that we can't do it by just putting our heads down, just doing more of what we've been doing. We can't kind of pretend that these drugs are going to work and able to do the same things that we're going to do in terms of approving them. I mean, the regulators have in many respects gotten it right. They've been able to come up with different approval pathways for these rare disease drugs. In many cases, researchers, clinical trials have gotten it right. We've gotten these novel and innovative research uh, clinical trial designs, everything from, you know, starting with those non-placebo control to even single arm trials to match trials. But the challenges are the information they provide are not ones that the uh, health technology assessors or even the payers are used to and are, do not provide the level of certainty in terms of the investment oftentimes in a very high cost drug. So we are very much, and I'm, I'm certainly not telling you anything that you don't know, but to really say, this is the challenge. This is the nut to what we're trying to, to achieve here. Next slide. So what we are saying is that what we need is to have smart systems. And what do we mean by smart systems? Well, from a health perspective, we look at what the definition of smart health systems are from the lights of you know, IBM Watson and, and others, is that they, first and foremost, have engaged patients. And I think we have that. They really work you know, with regard to digital, digital technology and being able to pick up on data and being able to re analyze that data and to use and share those, those data on a very timely basis. That the research evidence has to be timely produced. Again, very smart in, in the sense of being able to engage in the ongoing collection, but also making that evidence available. Um, decision supports. So when we're talking about how do we approve therapies, how do we make a decision in terms of whether or not they're going to be, you know, used in a particular situation, what are the kinds of mechanisms we need to support that decision, including the communications with patients and families around what it is that they're being faced with, but also with our payers. What are the supports they need in order to say, okay, we're convinced we can kind of move into this with you, even in light of what kind of restrictions there might be in terms of the evidence. The aligned governance, financial, and delivery arrangement. This is something that in Canada we're woefully lacking in. We're nowhere near aligned in terms of governance, finances, and delivery. We have really, you know, systems that are sitting out there, you know, you in the clinical world trying to make the best decisions and making disease, uh, uh, treatments available. The finance people that are looking at a very different set of criteria and oftentimes being really, really slower than you would want in terms of being able to make them available. And then the governance, we have a really highly, you know, fragmented governance system in terms of these therapies coming in. Where's the oversight? How do we assure that they're coming in and they're being managed right and being able to get to the appropriate people? We have to have a culture of rapid learning and improvement so that we can take up these therapies, we can learn from them, we can turn around those decisions, and we can make improvements. We have systems that provide for managed access, and hopefully some of you will talk about it. But quite frankly, I don't think in many cases, we take that information, we collect it, we analyze it in real time, and we turn it around to say, hey, here's what we're learning. Here's what we should be doing. Here's who else needs to be in. Here's what else we need to monitor. We don't put those decisions uh, even into the uh, hands of those who are most likely to be able to make those decisions, and namely those are the patients and the clinicians. Those decisions get moved two or three levels out for us to need to reapply, to get reapproval, to get refinancing in order to make a use of timely evidence. And we have to have built in the, the competencies for rapid learning and improvement. And that means building it into the infrastructure of what we're doing here. It doesn't just mean that, okay, we can hope that this will happen. It's got to be embedded in how we design the system. Next slide. And I don't mean to be preaching this, but I, because I think you know. Well, it does mean also, though, 
and I think this is a strict departure from what we're used to in terms of planning is that we have to be able to do agile planning. We have to do smart planning. We do have to have goals, but these goals have got to be, you know, not only in the same way that we talk about in terms of being able to be defined and measurable and achievable, but we have to be very realistic. And sometimes that's for us from the patient community as well, really being able to work collaboratively to understand where are we now, where do we need to be. Next slide. And the most important part that we're all coming into, of course, is using smart technology. We're hoping very much in the June conference that we will have the ability for many of these smart systems to be able to showcase kind of what it is that you already have access to, what is coming down the pike, how we can better integrate smart technology in terms of being able to diagnose, to be able to prescribe, and to be able to manage these patients. And you are already using much of this. I sit on one of the... Um, uh, task forces with the International Research Consortium of Rare Diseases, which is looking at uh, med medical technology for rare diseases. What's that next generation? And oh my gosh, I'm sure you all know, it is mind boggling what's out there. But if we can capture that, if we can bring that in, if we can invest in that as we're building our system, that will give us the best opportunity to say, okay, how do we optimize the funding that we've got? Core to that, of course, are the ability to share, to collect and share patient data. Tuesday, for those of you who are able to be here or who actually participated, we had a really important uh, webinar on patient registries and the what it is that we're already collecting, what are the systems that are set up. And it was really exciting to see how much Canada has really invested in terms of at least the pilot projects that are there or some of the early systems that are there. We have the capacity to do this. We've got to make sure that it is institutionalized and that it's widely available. And hopefully some of you will talk about that as well. Collecting that information and analyzing it in real time, being able to make it available and to look across our you know, jurisdictions. We've been told in many cases, oh my gosh, you can't share a patient data because of the restrictions. The best experts we know are telling us the opposite. There are no restrictions there. We just haven't actually put in place the right kinds of pathways to share information. There are no genuine restrictions here. So this is what we want to be able to do. And of course, wearables and other kinds of devices, smart hospital management, et cetera, all part of what we're talking about in terms of engaging in smart technology. Next slide. So this is what probably where I'm going to maybe just stop and kind of move into our um, presentations. I will say, and I don't know if many of you or how many of you had the opportunity to participate in what's in the last couple of weeks, Health Canada's or the Government of Canada's first draft of what they want to offer in the rare disease drug strategy. So as I said, we've been doing consultations for two years. We had um, Health Canada come in last January to do a series of consultations, and they said they consulted with over, I don't know, 300 people, maybe more than that, hosted X number of conferences, and produced a report, which was their What We Heard report. I think many of us felt pretty heartened by the What We Heard report, because we kind of felt like what they heard was what we said, and that is the need to invest in. A, a, a rare disease system, the need to invest in the you know, lane of, of infrastructure, the need to invest in those kinds of um, uh, patient-centered, but also uh, professional expert involved um, pathways for making drugs accessible. What we got back as the first offer on what this drug system could look like was the fact that they would like to propose a formulary. Now, they said it wasn't a formulary, but quite frankly, they're proposing a list of initial list of drugs, which they would seem to be the rare disease drugs that they call of common concern, of which we have no idea what a rare disease drug of common concern is. Um, and they really weren't you know, able to expand on that. Um, and as we said, you, know, you might not want to call it a formulary, but a list of drugs that you're hoping everybody will prescribe to or so sign up to is a formulary. The other thing is that they wanted to see how government, federal government could help support making these accessible. And again, we did said, you know, that was not where we should fill the gaps are. The gaps in terms of getting access are not having drugs that are already available and making sure that, you know, you're going to help pay for them. That is not going to be sufficient for us. So I think they heard that quite strongly. I think what we want to make sure is that we're able to, you know, get this opportunity to actually be able to set up this system. And I think it really will require 
you know, everyone working together, but it really will require us putting forth exactly what it is that we feel needs to be in place. So that was kind of, I, we feel the vision was there. We feel that they heard what was needed. We heard that they understand what the strategic pillars are. We just found that they were not at all close to delivering on them. Next slide. So, um, very quickly, I'll just do the highlights. We set pillar one, improve access to rare disease treatments and make it consistent across Canada. Obviously, we agreed to that. Pillar two, optimize, collect, and use data along the drug system continuum across the life cycle. Yes. Uh, pillar three, next slide, is support optimal patient outcomes, sustainability health system by spending on drugs that bring value for money. And their pillar four, strength and alignment of research and innovative systems. None of those are things that we would disagree with. I think the articulation of them, the implementation of them, the structure that would make them happen are things that we would want to very much be able to help define. So, uh, you know, this is kind of what this session is all about. Next slide. So initial response, is what we want to do is to make sure that we don't duplicate what already exists and that is funding. If we have gaps in terms of which patients are getting access, let's fill those gaps. Let's not put in another layer that's gonna also cover patients that are already covered. Let's make sure that we focus on those therapies but also focus on the right kinds of systems to support them. Next slide. Uh, governance and transparency, I think this is something that's a given. I won't belabor it because it's something that I think we can all talk about. I'm sure that we're all on the same page on, but I don't know that, you know, that needs to be belabored here. Certainly the last thing that we said in terms of that transparency and open access is to establish the Canadian Network for Rare Disease Centers of Excellence. We need to have them with the specialty networks embedded across the centers. These are what we believe will be the vehicles for the data collection analysis, which will also allow for aligning research and therapy management. Everything that um, the government's saying that we heard Everything that we're saying in terms of what the pillars are really does require that we have this network for centers of excellence and that we have them properly you know, supported to be able to do the kinds of tasks that we're talking about. And we believe that we have, um, hopefully you guys will verify that for us, that we have makings of that here and that we are going to be able to move forward on it. Next slide. So this is our webinar series, and I don't think we need to go through it, but you will see that we've been doing a whole series of these along the ways with one more to be coming up at the next May, but this has been our opportunities to really try to gather, you know, um, expertise, patients, uh, other stakeholders together to really talk about what's going to happen and what needs to happen in order for us to be able to build this smart rare disease system. Next slide. And then here is kind of where I think you're coming in. And I'm not going to belabor it again, but absolutely to say, we think the centers of excellence are the linchpin to the patients, the community care, and the collaboration. And that if we are able to invest in these appropriately, if we're able to develop this kind of a network, this is what it will take. We have the building blocks for it here. And I'm just delighted that we've got CIHR here. We've got um, Maestro here and to actually talk about, you know, how you know, what is already in place as a network can serve as a foundation for not only setting up the system, but potentially being that secretariat for the system. So a lot of the pieces that we need are already in existence. The question is, can we make sure that they're not only networked, that they're absolutely deeply embedded, but they're also properly resourced. Next slide. So this is our agenda for today, and at this point, I can stop talking. We're going to have three presentations from, you know, networks from outside of Canada. I'm just so really delighted to have Sarah Tellerico, who's going to talk about the European reference networks, which have been in place in Europe for, you know, I think uh, almost a decade now. And uh, hopefully, if Dominica, you know, um, can also join us when she is done, that would be really an advantage because she's heading up the um, National Rare Disease Center in Italy. Um, WHO RDI Global Rare Disease Network, Matt um, Bose Johnson, who is the lead on that for Rare Diseases International and has been also uh, helping us in terms of understanding what the concept for the global network would be and how we in Canada having a rare disease network can be a part of that. 
And then we're really delighted to have Mary Beth McAfee, who's going to talk to us about, you know, uh, North's centers of, of, of excellence and really how they went about setting it up, what is happening right now, what are the opportunities for us in terms of not only using them as a model, but potentially being able to consider how do we collaborate with them. We're then going to have some brief uh, uh, input from CIHR and their vision of kind of what is needed in terms of that research support into centers of excellence and the issues there. Um, Jerry is going to speak to us about what is already in place with MICERN and maybe their role in terms of moving this network forward. And then Ivana Jessic from uh, Geno Canada, who, you know, which has been already setting up some of these supports for uh, developing certainly centers in the, in the sense of diagnostics and being able to, to expand that across the country. And then we're gonna have some little drill downs in terms of some very specific uh, presentations. Um, Kim Boycott on the all for one genomics for rare diseases, as many of you will know, has really been not only a national uh, you know, a body for us in terms of being able to advance rare diseases, but really it's a standout global initiative. Um, we're going to have Cheryl, who um, I think is one of our strongest, strongest, you know, uh, researcher clinicians, but also, from my point, always a big friend of the rare disease patient community, talking about the metabolic disorders research clinical program and maybe beyond that. Um, we're going to have Leanne, who's going to talk about the Ottawa Pediatric Bone Health Group and what they're doing there in order to actually sit um, to support and to establish a center of excellence in that particular group. And I, I'm not sure if Craig's on, I'm hoping he is, is going to talk about the pediatric neurology research program and then have all of you, other clinicians who've been invited to really speak to us about what you're doing, but also what your reflections are and what we see as the part of the infrastructure here. Next slide. Okay, so these are the list of presenters. Next slide. And our invited panelists are all here. I'm hoping that you know we can get everybody who has to uh, has an opportunity to participate to kind of chime into it. And I know there are a few you may have to leave a bit early. So if you just signal to us that you are, then we can also make sure that you get an opportunity to to weigh in on in terms of the feedback. And I really appreciate so many of you being able to join us on very short notice. I know it's really challenging. Most of you have very busy practices that you're involved in and really taking the time away. So really delighted to have you here. So with that, I'm going to hopefully stop and turn it over to Sarah. And do you have the slides if you want, Sarah? I know Sarah's here, I saw her earlier. And yes. is, Sarah, is Sarah on? I did see her name, but I don't see it now. I know, I'm a little confused now because I know she was on before. Um, hmm. And I'm not sure that, is Matt on yet? Because I know Matt was going to be a little bit late in terms of being able to get here. No, he's not on yet. Okay, okay. I don't know what happened to Sarah. Let me, let's see if we can, I know she was on before. Let's see if we can send a note back to her to see if we can get her back on. Um, but maybe who we do have on here, absolutely for sure, is Mary Beth, who can talk to us about what's happening in the NORT centers of excellence, if that's okay. Mary Beth, can we start with you? Sure can. I'm glad I <laughs> Apologize. Let's see if we can chase down our other people. But over to you. I know Matt was going to be a bit late, and I don't know how we lost Sarah. Okay, can someone enable that I can share my screen because you don't have my slides. We, we can do that and okay. Yeah, you're on now. Okay. Okay, I am. All right. So let me just sorry.
you just give me a minute here and I'll have them up. Okay, there we go. So thank you for inviting me to speak here today. Um, my name is Mary Beth McAfee and I am the Associate Director of the Nord Rare Disease Center of Excellence Program. Um, and this is my favorite topic, so I'm really excited to be talking about it today. Just a reminder of NORD's mission. Um, NORD, like CORD, um, has the mission to advocate for all rare disease patients, their families, caregivers, and the organizations that serve them. So as you all know, on November 4th, 2020, NORD announced the 31 medical institutions that were designated as the inaugural NORD Rare Disease Centers of Excellence. So currently the program is technically just over five months old, but in reality, of course, it's much older than that and has a much longer history that began with impromptu discussions at medical conferences and the hallways of institutions and on, in Nord's offices when we were still in offices, um, as well as interviews with patient organizations that have established disease specific multidisciplinary clinic networks or centers of excellent networks. The success of the disease specific centers of excellence for increasing the quality of care, easing the burden on patients and families and accelerating research is clear. But this model is not scalable to 7,000 rare diseases as was demonstrated by the many patient organizations supporting diseases with very low prevalence that were struggling to establish a single specialty clinic, let alone a network of them. So NORD decided for many reasons that I don't have to um, tell all of you that the time to build a network of rare disease centers of excellence that could diagnose, treat, and research a broad range of rare diseases was now. It's always important to start with a vision, and our vision is not unique or even unexpected, but this vision led us to the how we were going to do this, and that in turn helped us determine what we would be seeking in an institution to be designated a rare disease center of excellence. So the how, through policy, by advocating for policies that increased affordable access to diagnosis and care, through professional education, by fostering a pipeline of rare disease clinical providers and researchers, through research, by educating and advancing broader research collaboration and inclusion across the rare disease community, through care, by cultivating collaboration across the network and beyond, to facilitate quality care, holistic experiences, and sharing of guidelines for the diagnosis, treatment, and management of rare and undiagnosed diseases. After all the discussions I mentioned a few slides ago, we developed a framework for the application. The goal of the application was to be able to establish that a center was dedicated to improving not only the care of rare disease patients and families, but their quality of life. We wanted questions that would help us find centers whose rare disease research was cutting edge and determined to move our rare disease knowledge forward. Centers who not only knew there was a shortage of rare disease clinicians and research, but also were making efforts to change that. We then brought about together a committee of about 10 stakeholders, mainly medical geneticists uh, leading, from top, leading top um, clinical genetic centers in the United States. Their input helped us weight the importance of the different questions. And from that, we developed a rubric of how the questions would be scored. So the application was broken, oops, sorry. Uh, yeah, the application was broken into two parts. There was a multiple choice section and an essay section. So there were 109 multiple um, choice questions focused on confirming the applicant had a broad range of specialists involved in rare disease research and care, as well as had the diagnostic and treatment capabilities required by rare disease patients and is able to coordinate, qua, qua, uh, sorry, coordinate complex care across multiple disciplines. The essay questions allowed applying centers to expand on their rare disease efforts and their dedication to improving the lives of rare disease patients through care, research, advocacy, and education, including the training of the next generation of rare disease specialists. For example, did they have established rare disease specific multidisciplinary uh, clinics? 
So were they part of a UDN site? Were they in our RDCRN in the United States? Did they have other collaborations across their institutions with other institutions or other stakeholders? What types of rare disease certified training programs did they have and what were their fill rates? What resources that did they provide specific to rare disease patients, families, and caregivers to, sorry, and did they have programs to reach the underserved? Did they have a plan to play in place to facilitate pediatric to adult transition? And what were their patient satisfa satisfaction scores as well as their efforts to improve those scores? Letters of supports were also requested and the letters of supports most often were from the future director of the program. But some of the, the applicants went all out with the most comprehensive, including the president and CEO of the Institute, the Dean of Research, the Dean of Education and Medical School, and the Dean of Clinical Practice. These letters often contained information um, that was asked in the essay questions, but the applicants felt they couldn't include because of the 750 word limit. The invited centers, um, so the first round of application for us was through invitation only, and the invited centers have been identified by multiple stakeholders as likely meeting the selection criteria. Conversations with those who received the invitations had been informally going on for three or more years. All of the invited centers were then invited to a technical assessment call. And this was really important because over the years, the program had been discussed and elements had involved and changed, evolved and changed. So one example would be that in the beginning, we were considering having different tiers of designations. So maybe bronze, silver, and gold. And then we, we changed that and, then, and thought, well, maybe national and regional uh, designation made sense. In the end, we decided on one level and each center would have an equal single vote in all decisions being made. Since the first round of applications was by invitation only, most centers were able to answer positively to all the multiple choice questions. In a few cases, when a center did not have a certain test or treatment, they had clear referral systems in place to nearby facilities. All the essay questions were scored using a rubric by three different Nord staff who had background in different areas, clinical, policy, and hospital administration. It was quite a large team of reviewers and none of us had more than eight or so applications to review. So about 80 essay questions and then the letters of support. That said, I was amazed that I was one of the reviewers and I was amazed at the level of effort and care that different centers put into the applications. None of the centers were looking for a sticker was what I was originally fearing. They really wanted to be part of a big change in the way research and care was being done. In the future, we will include the letters of support in our analysis because they were also very insightful and very helpful to understand the support across the institution, as well as allowing, um, allowing the uh, directors, the future directors to highlight or applicants to highlight certain aspects that they wanted to. Almost all of the applicants, not surprisingly, received designation. The few that did not received feedback on the program implementations that would increase their application strength in the future. So I'm sorry for the small print, but here is all 31 centers listed. And then here are the centers across the United States. And they're mapped to the US population density, which shows that they're that it pretty much matches. The centers are in the highest population density. We are missing some areas uh, currently, and that most notably is the Northwest region of the United States. So as we're revising the application for a second um, application cycle, we don't want to in any way change the criteria for designation, but we know we can evolve the first application to streamline the process further. I should note that this application cycle will be an open application cycle. So anyone who uh, would like to, feels they qual might qualify and would like to apply can apply within the United States. Although it would be tempting to include many of the multiple choice questions, I'm sorry, to not include many of the multiple choice questions because they really did little to differentiate between the applicants in our first cycle. 
Since our next cycle will be open to anyone who wishes to apply, we are aware these questions may have more importance. However, we are trying to consolidate the questions so that they would be considered, so that what might be considered basic specialists will be in a single question phrase, something like, please check any of the following specialists, the specialties that your center does not have in-house and explain your process for referring patients needing this type of specialist. We are currently also going through the essay questions and we're reviewing the, the reviewers' comments to see which questions may need to be reworded to get more helpful answers from the applicants. We did get feedback, as I noted before, that the 750 word limit was difficult for the applicants to include everything that was laid out in the rubric. Um, also, there was a heavy emphasis in the first round on having an ACGME certified clinical training program which though important, maybe shouldn't outweigh other efforts, such as maybe a training, training researchers in rare disease research might carry similar wet, weight, or also understanding that with the designation, these programs, if they do have a medical school associated with them or a program can develop a fellowship program um, with, with our support. So a few thoughts to consider. Probably the first and wisest, um, I have actually taken from Pam Gavin, who's also on this call, um, and that is to really think of those really worthy applicants that due to being very focused center or a children's hospital won't meet the designation criteria, which is to handle all rare diseases across a lifetime um, and not just genetic diseases, because we all know rare diseases are not just genetic. So how do you handle these situations in such a way that it, it won't be offending to the applicant while staying true to your vision? Can you think of a solution you can provide? So three concrete examples from our experience are the Children's Hospital of Orange County and the University of California, Irvine joined together to put in a strong application. Similarly, Children's Boston Children's Hospital, which is actually an independent children's hospital, um, joined with Massachusetts um, General Hospital and um, Brigham and Women's Hospital to put in a strong application. Kennedy Krieger Institute in Baltimore, which focuses on neurological, rehabilitative, and developmental needs of children through young adults, joined with Johns Hopkins Medical Center. So helping the applicants see that maybe they need to, that, that it might be in their best interest to join with other institutions nearby them makes the application stronger. And it also is the first step to, towards collaborating. Some other thoughts, um, knowing your vision and what you want to analyze will help you determine what questions to ask, the format of the questions and how to weight the questions. Every part of this process takes time. And although you don't want to get stuck in any part of it, you also don't want to rush due to a pre-announced commitment because the unforeseen can and does happen. So be cautious when making announcements that may commit you to a very challenging timeline. And I will pref have to preface my last comment here as my own from my experience in the past five months, as well as the past 15 years working in the rare disease space, helping patients find specialists and supporting patient groups. Physicians and researchers change institutions or move into industry more often than most people realize. Having co-directors helps maintain stability when it, is a director, when it is the director of a COE that actually leaves. When independent institutions apply as one, having more than one director can help liaise with the different institutional administrations. And it can also help having two uh, co-directors or more in one case, um, Boston, the Harvard group actually ended up with three co-directors. Um, it can really help to have those co-directors to attend, help attend meetings so that they aren't having to appoint a delegate that may not be as involved in the process or the program as well as eases the burden of requested tasks, especially when they're working across multiple institutions. So I thank you very much for your time. Um, and if you have any questions, I don't know that there'll be time right now, but please do feel free to email me and ask any questions. I'm happy to talk anytime about my favorite program. 
Wow, thank you so very much, Mary Beth. I love the fact that you were able to squeeze so much in so very concisely and exactly what we needed to know in terms of both the process, but also kind of where the vision is. And really, you know, I hope I'm not over speaking on behalf of everybody here, but we look forward to how we can absolutely be able to connect better. So many thanks to you and obviously many thanks to Pam as well. With that, I'm not going to stop for questions at the moment because we do have Matt on, Matt Bose Johnson, who I introduced briefly uh, as we were setting up and who did have an opportunity to speak to us at one of our previous webinars, but I really wanted him to be able to share the vision of the Global Rare Disease Network with us here, and um, he has joined us, I think, just coming in uh, from um, another uh, trip that he was on, but if you, if you don't mind, Matt, I'm going to turn it right over to you. Thanks, Dohan. Uh, nice to meet everyone again, or some of you again. Um, uh, I, and it's really, oh, I need to be able to share my screen if that's possible. It's really nice to hear about the Nord uh, Centres and Excellence Programme and how that's developing. It's really exciting to hear. And Lisa's coming over to our event in uh, Geneva at the end of this month to share more of that, their experiences in North America. Um, I was asked to present about what we're doing globally with the WHO. Um, uh, and some of you might have heard me do this before, so but uh, I was at, uh, suge it was suggested that maybe some people would like to hear it again, or these new people who would like to um, uh, also be hear the, the what we're doing globally. Um, so just to put some context globally. Um, and you probably know this, rare diseases is gaining momentum as a key UN policy area. From 2016 to to date, the messaging around rare diseases being a public health priority uh, for, for the UN and for the WHO has really started to sink in. And I, I'm thrilled to have to update this slide um, in February this year with Rudy Gukresh at the bottom here. And we've been working with Rudiger, uh, Rare Disease International has, um, and the WHO to uh, explore the possibility of developing a global network for rare diseases. And for the last two years, we've been collaborating with him and he's been supporting our events. And in the, wor the World Expo in Dubai for Rare Disease Day, he, he said for the first time uh, uh, openly, uh, and publicly that as, as we're moving to put these issues of rare diseases on the political agenda of governments, now it's time to follow with action in healthcare systems, strengthening in rare diseases, and for a global network for rare diseases to be set up. And this is the, this is the road which the WH is now going down um, uh, with us as a community. So um, that's, that's the first time he said that publicly. So that's a commitment by the WHO and they follow through with that. So we, we, we're moving to a very um, exciting point in the process now of moving from the research to actually the pilot. And um, the reason why we want to set up a global network is very much stems from the 2019 UN resolution for UHC, which we included in rare diseases in that resolution, so uh, which was unanimously signed off and all governments say to deliver UHC, they will deliver that for people with a rare disease as well. They're a community which is specifically named. And they mentioned about really focusing to do that, to focus on strengthening healthcare systems locally, the capacities locally. Now, you know, Canada's got a fantastic healthcare system, but the size and geography of, of Canada is huge. And um, thinking through how, how you as centres, leading centres and CORD can collaborate to strengthen that system with the government, this is what this resolution is pushing for. Um, all systems can be can be strengthened really to meet these needs um, of rare diseases. And the new resolution, which we had approved in December this year, actually goes one step further. And this resolution on tackling the challenges of people living with the rare disease and their families uh, calls on member states to develop and create uh, networks of expert centres um, and to strengthen international collaboration, either regionally or globally. So this resolution, which was passed, almost strengthens the mandate of for the WHO to set up a global network. It, it, it pushes um, nationally the governments to start thinking about preparing the groundwork for this pilot network. And Brazil, who was one of the co-sponsors of the, this resolution, 
is it starting to also move in setting up a, a national network so and and nord is moving in that direction as well so so i think the 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 that we're making a step forward and the, the environment globally on uh, networking in rare diseases is maturing now and we need to leverage that in all, all communities. Um, the model which we've got for rare diseases really focuses on connect, uh, uh, adapt it, uh, having a model which each healthcare system which is different can define how they should uh, connect and work together locally uh, to connect into a regional uh, virtual networks, let's say in North America um, or, or South America or um, in East Mediterranean. And then these regional hubs around the world can connect into a global network. So we, we see this as being these national, these national hubs could be single centre or multi-centre. So in Paris, in France, it could be the NICARE, but the NICARE, it could be a, a, the national hub of the French system because it's leading the filières across France, connecting all the hospitals. So really this isn't the, the leading hospital stepping forward and being recognized above the others. It's about the, that, the national hub coordinating the collaboration of all those centers and experts in a country to participate regionally and globally. It's about being inclusive, not exclusive. So these national hubs are really important to be able to plug in to global knowledge and really draw on that and to use that, leverage it locally and strengthen the system. Um, the regional hubs are a collection of national hubs. Uh, for bigger countries, we probably see two or three national hubs um, uh, in, in the US for 300, uh, for, for the size of population, it won't be one national hub, it'd probably be five or six. Um, so we need to sort of look at how that's organised and that's a reflection to be done locally. That's for, for in, in your country, in, in Canada, um, to think how, how best to organise and, and coordinate to be able to connect into a pilot network. Um, I'll talk about the global bit in a second. Um, so we did a mapping exercise of the existing collaborations uh, uh, which uh, around the world based on you know, shared needs, shared culture, shared language. Um, and the, we found that there was about 17 natural collaborations which were, which were, which were there. Um, you can see here Canada and, North, and, and, and the US um, uh, collaborate obviously very closely. Um, and Mexico and Brazil we've got here in white because they're bridge countries in, in some countries um, actually connect with two or three regions almost and collaborate with both. So Mexico collaborates with North America, but also collaborates with South America. Brazil co collaborates also with, with Portugal as well as um, Latin American countries. And the same here with Turkey, collaborates with East, uh, East Mediterranean region um, to the East and uh, Europe to the West. Um, so we, we see that we want to try and encourage the, these regional hubs, national hubs being recognized, um, connecting a national system into a, a regional hub, 17 regional hubs connecting into a global hub, and it will take time to develop this. So the global network is very much aimed to try and ensure that people with a rare disease, no matter where they live, can reach a, ne a network of experts, expertise to access appropriate knowledge, diagnosis and care national hubs could be single or multiple centers it's for local uh, to be locally tailored and designed for the local systems uh, to, they need to connect together in a hub and spoke model and to be a knowledge adapter to enable that healthcare system in large could get access to more uh, regional and global knowledge to apply locally regional hubs of uh, are virtual multi-center um, uh, networks are based on shared experience, shared culture, and be, being built with a shared vision. Um, and we want to see about exploring how we can leverage the existing digital platforms to enable collaborations in regions where there might be a will to collaborate, but they haven't got the infrastructure. Um, globally, these national hubs and regional hubs will come together and form a learning system um, and to and to inform global policy, which then can be implemented through those regional national hubs locally um, and advance uh, leverage the advancements in technology. 
when we look at the pathways to accessing treatment, the, the, the treatments which are available, actually, um, what, when we looked and engaged with people around the world, we, we saw that actually there was a pathway, an access pathway, which needed to be built in each region to enable faster access and adoption to therapies which are existing and new therapies. Um, and the first step in that pathway really is about recognising and designating those centres who are, are the experts to be able to provide diagnosis and enable them to access diagnosis. Um, maybe that's obvious, but, but that's not there in many cases. Um, in lots of countries around the world, people don't know who the experts are, don't get diagnosis, so it remains hidden, the burden of disease in that country. So therefore, governments aren't prioritising rare diseases because they don't understand the, the prevalence and the, the burden in the, in the system. So designation of expert centres enables access to diagnosis, which enables the aggregation of, uh, of data to be able to um, uh, influence governments to prioritise um, uh, to do rare diseases as a priority and build a budget. Um, uh, also provide access to and awareness to knowledge to be able to support um, uh, access to therapies and to also uh, um, establish a health technology assessment uh, to be able to uh, put these therapies into um, be available locally. So the, the vision of a network of networks, this global network, we won't get there in one year, we're going to get there in a stepwise approach. So we, we've finished now the technical research stage. Um, we now move into the pilot network stage and we have an event, a side event to the World Health Assembly in Geneva this month. Um, and we'll be looking to pull that pilot together with identifying uh, people to join that pilot, countries and regions and, and uh, leaders uh, who have been ex who've been the, the, the forerunners of and innovators in this uh, network care model and providing clinical networks for their population so we can learn from uh, and develop, but also bring people who new communities in, in this mix as well, who are not just um, lead from from all 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 regions, as it were. Um, we'll move to deployments around 2025. Um, we'll probably pilot the regional hub models here, and then deploy them, moving to one per region here, and then expanding to full operations across the regions by 2028. Key messages: Red diseases is gaining a, as a public health priority. Um, the UN resolution strengthens the mandate to develop a global network and national networks. Um, we have a high level support um, by the WHO um, and we have this side event coming up which will focus on strengthening healthcare systems and building a global network. Um, our work so far, which has been submitted to the WHO, has been very well received because it's been grounded, well grounded in the needs of our community. And we've got great representation from Canada in that process. Um, and we've got support uh, of a panel of experts from 101 countries uh, from all regions. So now it's timely to start preparing that those foundational um, uh, those foundations to enhance collaborations locally, like in Canada. All right, all right. Thank you so much, Matt. And I'm sure that there are a million questions. We've got a whole bunch of questions as well that we have for uh, Mary Beth and for what the US model is. But I, I, I knew we should have gone for three hours. You know, Chris and, and Etienne, when we first talked about this, we said we needed three hours. And of course, we absolutely should have. I'm a little bit, um, we do have Sarah here from Telrico, who um, we have asked to speak on the ERNs. I'm going to just ask Sarah if you're okay to hang on because what I'd like to do, and even though I'd like to go into a Q&A, what I'd really like to do is slip over a little bit, give an opportunity for CHR, for uh, Genome Canada, and for Meister and Tutani, just give us, you know, maybe we just without slides, with just feedback. How do you think this fits into what we're envisioning in Canada and kind of what the vision you would have in terms of how your institution, your foundation would contribute to um, the uh, centers of excellence, but also what the value might be for you. Maybe I'll just start with either Chris or Etienne from CHR, if you wouldn't mind just kind of responding. Sure thing, Durhane. Um, well, I think a network of centers of excellence for rare diseases, you know, would be a very important 
um, advance for Canada. It would enable a lot of things to, in, to actually um, occur in a manner that would be much more coordinated than we can do now. And one of the CIHR is primarily a research funding organization. So we're looking to fund research to then support decisions that could then affect health, right? And health decisions and how we go about that. Um, and so if you're looking at a rare inherited disease clinical trials network or centers of excellence network, that's going to facilitate many things um, that we could, we could move forward as far as research questions. You know, right now, you know, for the diagnostic odyssey that many um, rare disease patients undergo, you know, genomes are still essentially, or, or exomes tend to still be the last thing that happens. Can we move those to the front of the diagnostic pipeline? And if you could do analyze these en masse through a centers of excellence versus a series of one-offs, you could get, you could then really determine you know the value in terms of getting the diagnosis early. Does it actually change you know everything from you know uh, some patients and, and perhaps preventing intellectual disability that might not have been caught if we followed the current, current diagnostics you know and from direct and, and showing direct costs to the healthcare system. Does it improve them or not? But also you know LC questions like. Uh, psychological burden to kids and their families, you know, when you're trying to, to manage this. So that's one thing it would help with. Um, I think also, as I brought up, just dealing with the cost of diagnosing and treating rare diseases in Canada, if we actually had centers of excellence, we could get at this. Um, but also, I think we could do things like implement ORFA codes in sort of a more uniform fashion versus, uh, and, and then do the research into, if you do implement ORFA codes, can you do a better job of tracking direct costs? Um, and, but also, I think having centers of excellence would then also enable people to be enrolled into clinical trials much easier because you'd actually have a center, a, a network that would enable you to do so. So that way our primarily kids um, could get access to potential therapies much earlier than they do now because Canada, without having sort of a, a, a national entity, centers of excellence, it, it's harder to do the clinical trials. And that means that the access to the medicines might not be when they're first available. It's after they're approved somewhere else and then you got to wait a few years, blah, 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 blah. Um, and also, if Canada is thinking as part of its bio, bio uh, manufacturing strategy, one of the things they're considering with their AAV vector ramp up is trying to bring um, therapies for rare diseases into the clinic. And it would be great if you had an actual series of centers of excellence that could help identify what are the most pressing um, diseases Canada could look at as far as AAV vectors. Um, but they're also trying to do it in an open science way and, and in a um, cost production way and actually almost gave away the secret sauce to the rest of the world because it would be done by NRC and the government of Canada as a way to keep costs down and increase access and increase equity for therapies for kids with rare diseases. So it would enable a ton of things that CHR could fund research on to show that it actually works if you do these things. And that would be the evidence the provinces and territories and feds would then maybe need to actually then line out of these things versus um, right now not doing so. so. So I think that's where this type of entity could really help. And CHR could then provide the funds um, that could provide the evidence to show that, you know, um, each of these things we've talked about, um, and there's others, but that's just a sampling of sort of what's bubbled to the top on the implementation research side, at least that I think something like this could really help. With. This has been such a helpful, I think, um, framing of kind of where this can be, and certainly, as you say, going into the research, but also the disease monitoring. Um, and I think that you guys have been really, I think, uh, really visionary in terms of where we need to go in terms of certainly expanding the capabilities there. Maybe because you mentioned the network of clinical trials, maybe if you don't mind, Thierry, I can pivot over to you. I think, uh, you know, I said it before and I say it now, you know, we are in Canada in so much better position than almost anybody to actually be able to have a genuine network that can actually work as a network. I mean, we hear what the U.S. has, but, you know, they're a network and in, in, in being the name of a network, but we could actually be a network. Well, I will say even something as simple as we wanted to set up a pediatrics, essentially one-stop shop for REBs and my turn took the lead on that. And now we've kind of got one and it took all of two years to say this, we should do it. And then it was done. Um, and I think that's one example of yeah. how, you know, we can turn on a dime if we need to. And my son did a great job as well as the other collaborators of getting that done. And so I think this is the next logical step um, uh, to follow along with that. 
Brilliant. Thierry, can you kind of follow up in terms of what Chris sure. is saying there? Yeah, well, thank you, Chris, for the compliment on the cheer and the uh, ethics harmonization process. It's in pro work in progress. We are making progress, but hopefully we will get there in the next you know, couple of years. Yeah, so uh, for those who may not know, my CERN Maternal Infant Child Youth Research Network, you know, is uh, a federally registered organization, not for profit, uh, incorporated uh, with a charitable status uh, created more than 10 years ago. And the goal of, of the organization is to link the uh, 18 academic uh, child health centers across the country from, uh, you know, coast to coast. Uh, and their research institute uh, affiliated, uh, uh, as well as more than 25, I think it's now around 30, uh, subspecialty networks. So networks of individuals uh, uh, working on specific conditions and essentially uh, doing different kinds of studies uh, and certainly a clinical trial in the rare disease space. They are not all rare disease focused, but many of them are. And uh, my son, three or four years ago, when I became the scientific director, went through a, a strategic exercise to determine what should be the priority and supporting clinical trials, so basically facilitating those networks to get access you know, to all the pieces that are required to uh, execute a clinical trial you know, fast and with the high quality of uh, methods and uh, data collections that you know, is required, certainly by the regulator, by F Canada, that's something that my son should invest in. And we have done that over the last you know, couple of years. We have now uh, uh, capacity to function as an academic research organizations to help investigators to go to Health Canada for single patient study, CTA. We are developing capacity to do monitoring across the country, which is something that investigators are really looking for as part of you know, a requirement from Health Canada. We have you know, capacity to reach out to uh, methodology experts, uh, rare, you know, disease kind of design. Um, and uh, we have also an ability to develop, you know, a database that are kind of, uh, you know, approved by Health Canada, you know, for regulated trials. So this is something that we have put forward to uh, uh, Health Canada when we had our um, uh, consultations uh, last year. And I think there is an opportunity with this uh, strategy to secure some funding to support this kind of infrastructure. And of course, my son would love to help, you know, all those rare disease networks to get together and to get supported through an infrastructure. So instead of duplicating the A4, we actually built the capacity for all those networks to uh, uh, run, you know, trial in an efficient way getting patients engaged you know, for uh, protocol design, um, uh, identifications of outcome. So this is something that we are certainly very interested in uh, supporting. Uh, and you know, I suspect that we would work with many of those centers of excellence and we would be the glue kind of to support you know, them in their end behavior when it pertains to clinical trial. I apologize, my internet connections may not be always, you know, uh, stable, so sorry for that. No, we heard you loud and clear throughout, and your picture stayed perfect throughout. So, you know, we saw you and we heard you, and those were really, really, I think, really strong endorsements. Before I turn it over to some of the individual programs and also back to the ERNs, I wonder if I can get Ivana uh, to kind of maybe speak a little bit about kind of where Genome Canada is and maybe your vision in terms of the support for and also the um, use for uh, centers of excellence? Yeah, so thank you very much for the opportunity to be a part of this conversation today. Um, uh, yeah, and I see in our participant uh, list today in this meeting, many of the clinical leads that are um, have been a part of what uh, Genome Canada has has labeled and as a, the all for one initiative. And if I could just roll back a little bit, I mean, Genome Canada is a nonprofit organization that is funded by the federal government, but we work in partnership with our regional centers across the country and also other co-investors to bring uh, genomics to the fore from research now into clinical implementation. And we're, we're really trying to, uh, um, yeah, push the, push the needle from research into clinical implementation. So we built something, what might, be perceived as a network actually. And, and those, uh, my, 
the the clinical clinicians on those projects might want to uh, uh, comment on that later on. But um, we have a portfolio of projects, so not just sim uh, a, a network of projects that are uh, funded in, for pediatric diagnostics uh, guided by genome-wide sequencing across the country. There are six of them. So we're, this is a portfolio of projects um, with the bigger picture of connecting uh, the dots, facilitating best practices, uh, seeing genomics become standard of care for all patients equitably across the country. Um, so I actually see quite a bit of um, learnings here, maybe we can take, but also opportunities for some international partnerships uh, through these other networks that we're seeing globally. Um, so yes, yeah, so the, the approach was um, a very strategic, uh, certainly um, um, in injecting funds uh, through these, uh, this network of projects, but um, also building upon that, uh, um, moving away from siloed initiatives into what's now uh, approaching a data sharing initiative. And also on top of that, um, there's a complementary project that has also been um, embedded in this initiative, and that is um, um, understanding the policy that will be required for, for um, uh, you know, evaluating ethics and then also the um, um, perceived barriers, perhaps, for data sharing across our jurisdictions, because um, Canadian ha Canada has a unique context for for how healthcare is delivered. So we're we're tackling those on, on many different uh, levels, and um, yeah. So I see many parallels. We can certainly learn from here. Um, and uh, yeah, so so we're trying to do, so as a funder that has traditionally um, injected, you know, invested in research, we're really trying to support the community on this clinical implementation now for the diagnostic component, which then of course informs treatment and reduces the diagnostic odyssey for so many of these families. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Yvonne. And of course, you know, Canada has been such an important part of, as you're saying, moving the um, the process in terms of rare disease this is part of your genomics and precision medicine maybe this is a great segue if i can get sarah to hang on with us from erns for a little bit longer because i think it, it's a natural segue for me to ask if um kim would actually be willing to kind of lead off our discussions about canada and talk about the uh, the all for one project and and the gazillion other things that you know you know are coming out of geo yeah, exactly. Let me just uh, share a slide for a second, okay? Sorry, I'll be really quick. Sorry, I'm not doing a better job of introducing people. Many of you know each other, and um, I'd rather us get into the heart of it. Um, and if you don't know who Kim is, then I don't even know why you're on this call. No. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Okay, good. And let me just switch those. Good, and I want to, well, I'll put my camera on in a second. Okay, guys, so um, let me just go back to the top here. All right, so leading off from that, um, uh, basically um, what Genome Canada um, has set out to do is um, try to catalyze the way we, and revolutionize actually, the way we share data across um, the country and. CHR is also very interested and invested in, has, has been having conversations with us along with lots of the other stakeholders that are on this call. And so the, uh, I'm going to talk about two things really quickly, the all for one data sharing uh, partnership, and then um, how that links to something that's got a much more um, research slant to it. So the all for one data sharing partnership is, is um, really has a goal to ensure access to clinical genome wide sequencing as standard of care. Um, as well as lay the foundation for precision health in Canada. So we're really looking at uh, bringing these things to, sorry about the dog, uh, to sharing clinical and genomic data within the learning healthcare system, um, and then enabling equitable access to research, which I think has um, some, some, some really important um, uh, subtleties to that because that really goes back to what we've been talking about with respect to centers of excellence. And so enabling this kind of infrastructure in Canada will make sure access to research is actually equitable. All right, so, um, so what the patient experience would look like here, just to give everyone a quick um, view, the patients are over here. I think you can see my mouse. Um, clinical assessment, 
clinical information consenting to genome-wide sequencing, uh, which is now being performed at these multiple sites across Canada um, with the with the um, support of Genome Canada and their, their stakeholders within their provinces, consent to genome-wide sequencing. And then we have two platforms here. The one, the Knowledge Network, uh, is going to en enable us to share clinical and genomic data across the country for these diagnostic labs to produce um, the best analysis possible. And then the second, um, which I think is the really interesting research part is called All for One Connect, where every patient who is uh, participated in this um, testing has the option to be recontacted for research. And here, I think is where we could start to set up this national infrastructure uh, with the help of partners like MyCERN, et cetera, where we could have this recontact registry connected to natural history studies, patient registries, um, and then uh, other ways to, to, for families to elect to share their data to advance knowledge of rare diseases. And so in this model, um, researchers with, with REB approved protocols could come in and identify patients for all kinds of data sharing, uh, natural history studies, clinical trials, et cetera. Uh, and I think we could then expand this so that anybody uh, who has a rare disease can then come into this platform and have a place to be recontacted for research. Um, and then our interest, of course, my personal interest is around um, understanding the genomics of rare disease. And so we need a place to centralize and harmonize this data from the recontact registry. Um, and so we need this sort of data type to help us understand the genome. Uh, and so what we need is a data lake for rare disease research, and that's where Genomics for RD comes in. And so we launched that almost um, two years ago as a place to collect this data that has been consented for research uh, by families participating in, in Care for Rare and other Genome Canada and CIHR funded um, uh, initiatives. And so this is Genomics for RD. It is a cloud-based infrastructure um, and it allows pat uh, patient uh, data that has been consented for research to come into it from across the country. Uh, and it uh, is based and set up for the sole purpose of sharing. Uh, because we all know, as we've been, it's been highlighted, I think, by Matt, uh, you know, Canada has some geography issues and some population uh, density issues, and we need to be able to collaborate internationally in order to advance some of these, these rare disease questions and, and research uh, that we have. And so this is just the model, which I won't go into, but basically we're, we, we've set it up such that we will have the ability to share as much data as we can in an appropriately uh, safe and private way for families um, with, with all the partners that we want to set up from across the country. And so with those things, I think, I think the All for One initiative could be the umbrella to, to all of this, but with Genomics for RD underneath it as just one part of that additional infrastructure that we could set up across the country um, uh, to help advance um, all the things that we want to do. Good. Okay, that's all I had, I think, in terms of slides, Dee. That was amazing. And again, the whole program is amazing, as we all know, and really brings in, I think, certainly a, maybe a decade long of work that you've been doing in this area and bringing together, as you've also shown, some of the other initiatives that we've got around phenotypes and around uh, genome exchange. So this is Phenome Central. So really, as I keep saying, we have the basis for so much here in Canada that's already yeah. operational. Before I, Sarah, if you don't mind, before we flip to the ERNs, I think I would really love to ask Cheryl Greenberg, I mean, I think following on what Kim has said to kind of speak and introduce, you know, a, a bit of your, you know, kind of work and what you've been doing, because it's really not in exactly the same area, but really moving towards what we're wanting to also use the rare disease um, centers of excellence for, and that is also how do we use it to manage um, access to therapies and to be able to uh, better, you know, uh, support the patients. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Duran. Can you hear me? Yeah. We can hear you. We can see you. Okay. All right. Good. I don't have any slides, um, and it was done on purpose because I wanted to hear all the other speakers and to really know where I should focus my talk. Um, but some of you know that I'm a metabolic specialist and clinician scientist in Winnipeg at the University of Manitoba, working with hereditary metabolic disorders, the inborn errors of metabolism, and I've been exclusively working on these really for over over 40 years. Um, 
I'm particularly interested in helping move forward um, this strategy uh, to form the Canadian Network of Centers of Excellence for Rare Disorders. And um, uh, I certainly, I see so many initiatives that are, I cannot say how many seminars and webinars I've attended related to between Health Canada, provincial, federal, and territorial drug plan discussions, as well as all the, the, the forums that have been sponsored by, by CORD. And um, they're all extremely informative. Um, I'm here, you know, representing, you know, my province of Manitoba's clinical metabolic program, which is in, um, I think, real jeopardy um, of being able to fulfill our role as providing access to timely diagnosis and access to newly approved treatments for our patients um, in Manitoba um, for inborn errors and metabolism. So anything that I can do to help participate in a national um, initiative, I'm very, very willing to move forward. And I say that um, my experience involved in working with networks uh, relates. In the past, I was involved in the federal and the CIHR funded networks of centers of excellence research, which really helped facilitate research in, in Canada in rare diseases. And also, um, I've also, in many, some of you may know that we had in Manitoba a cardiac inquest when our pediatric cardiology program was shut down um, in the 90s and, and early 2000s because of an increased number of, of unexplained deaths that were felt to be preventable um, for children undergoing open heart surgery in Winnipeg. And the pediatric cardiology program was really decimated, closed down at the time, and which was, you know, it was really devastating. But out of the ashes emerged a Western Canadian pediatric cardiac network through the efforts of many, many people and really championed by Brian Postal. And what this turned is a program that was de decimated in pediatric cardiology to an absolutely excellent network across Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta for the delivery of care for children with, you know, um, severe pediatric congenital heart disease. And it was done really because of the um, efforts of people in the prairies to set up a prairie network for congenital heart disease diagnosis and management. And that resurrected our program. And I would say that we possibly have gone from worst to first in the kinds of care we provide our pediatric cardiology patients. And I use that as an example of something that I would like to see happen in my field of rare inborn errors of metabolism, because you know we do not, and I say we, and I'm mentioning Manitoba, and I'm speaking for Saskatchewan as well, where I consult now as a metabolic specialist for many years, the waiting list for the diagnosis of inborn errors of metabolism and hereditary metabolic disease is this extremely long, it's not long if you are very, very sick as something that we can count on in our healthcare system to be cared for if you're very, very sick. Uh, but for the average patient referred for the evaluation of a possible inborn air metabolism, the wait list can be from one to four years. And this is completely unacceptable. We do not have a dedicated physician for inborn errors of metabolism in Saskatchewan, and frankly, not in Winnipeg either, even though we have several geneticists who have a lot of expertise in rare metabolic diseases. It's not dedicated to inborn errors of metabolism, like I see the programs that, that are all in the uh, more populous centers of Calgary, Toronto, Ottawa, Quebec, etc. So, um, I see the advantages, and I know of many advantages, and we all know the advantages to form a network of rare disease centers of excellence. It's something that I would like to participate in and help move, and it's really because I think it's the only way to move forward in my province and in Saskatchewan, and perhaps in Alberta as well, in this field of, of rare metabolic diseases. So what I've been able to do over the past several years um, through the assistance of 
of Genome Prairie and Genome Canada to be one of those six gaps. Thanks very much. And it's going extremely well. And it's, it's the Canadian Prairie Metabolic Network. And um, it's, uh, it, we went live in November 2021. Although the funding started April 2021, it took at least six months to get all the contracts signed and things through REB and to set up our team. And um, it's extremely, it's going extremely well. Like in the first year, we've enrolled uh, 70 patients already through our uh, CPMN, Canadian Prairie Metabolic Team. And there are themes that are emerging. And what is emerging more than and we've been able to provide diagnoses to about 20% of referrals. I think it's going to go higher as we advance the omics first approach to these patients. But the theme that's emerging is that um, unquestionably, all the healthcare providers, and especially the patients, are very grateful for the opportunity to participate in research and at the same time have their questions heard and actually have, be able to dialogue. Even if you don't provide an answer, patients really care that someone is listening and that we can provide care and access to diagnostics in a timely way. And, you know, a diagnostic is absolutely the key to be able to provide access to new treatments. Without a diagnosis, you know, we, we don't know what to treat. So um, it's a privilege to be the academic lead of this uh, Genome Prairie project um, to develop this Prairie Metabolic Network. I'm interested in moving forward how this can translate into the national initiative to perform a rare disease centers of excellence, but I'm committed to help in, in any way I can. So um, there's another aspect to rare disease um, initiatives in Canada, and that is, I think, the value. There's many values, of course, to being a network, but the post-marketing surveillance, I think, um, for ultra-rare diseases can really be uh, facilitated um, in a very positive way with a, a national rare disease uh, network strategy. So I think I'll stop here. I'm happy to answer any questions and I hope I haven't taken up too much time. You're, you're, the, whatever time you have is always, always uh, valuable. I know so you're, always, you're always, you're no, always. No, 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 you're always so. And I think you ended on exactly what I wanted to make sure we get to and that is the ways in which we need to have, not only can contribute, say it's essential without these kinds of networks, right? We are not going to be able to do the post-market and to be able to do it right across the, the, the country. So that's important. I'm, I'm actually begging on Sarah to hang on with me a little bit longer because I think it's the right time for me, if you don't mind, to slip to actually turn to um, to Leanne and to maybe build on what you're saying and, and give us, she said she had about five minutes that she can give us in terms of you know, what's happening with the uh, the pediatric bone health. So over to you, Leah. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to, um, you know, contribute to this dialogue. And like Kim, I've just put a few slides together. This will not be very long at all, Durham, but I did want to just share with you the journey that I've experienced in establishing a network across Canada that's now international, that's moved the dial on understanding pediatric rare bone diseases or childhood onset rare bone diseases and how we can maybe learn from that as we think about centers of excellence. So I lead the Ottawa Pediatric Bone Health Research Group, and it is affiliated with CHEO, the hospital, the University of Ottawa, the CHEO Research Institute, and of course, very closely linked to the clinic at CHEO that services children with childhood onset bone disorders. And we're also linked to a patient advocacy organization called bonescanada.org that we've developed as we've moved forward. I really have to credit CIHR with having launched this whole thing. And I see CIHR is represented today. CIHR funded me in my very early days in 2003 to set up a national research study looking at steroid induced osteoporosis in children. It was a six year study. It was um, funded nicely to get going. And through that, we learned as an Ottawa based headquarters how to run a national study, how to set up infrastructure across the country, including centralized skeletal imaging. We developed the relationships that we needed. I always say that 
The secret to clinical research is relationships. So we built the relationships that we needed. And from there, we went on to be funded by other organizations to study rare bone diseases in children, both in terms of investigator initiated studies, as well as pharmaceutical collaborations, natural history studies, drug trials. And uh, it's been really quite an incredible experience doing that. In Ottawa, we're a 20 person based sort of core group. And then we have a number of international collaborators and currently are working with international collaborators in the Duchenne muscular dystrophy space, which is very intensely studied and also in achondroplasia and other rare diseases of childhood. With the knowledge that has come out of the research We've had to share that. We've had to, of course, publish, which is one of the ways we get messages out to our clinical and scientific colleagues. But we've also needed to just empower clinicians in how to better care for patients with rare disorders. And then, of course, to engage and empower families living with rare disorders. So we've started two initiatives, the Canadian Consortium for Children's Bone Health and the Canadian Alliance for the Rare Disorders of the Skeleton. And together, they accomplish these advocacy kinds of roles. So for example, we're holding webinars that Triple CBH um, undertakes in order to educate health professionals in rare diseases. And the CARDS initiative is to engage with patient advocacy groups and put on lay type of webinars. And so these are some of our lay group um, partners that we've worked with. And I must say the pandemic has really facilitated these relationships because we can do Zoom webinars, we can reach families coast to coast. And uh, we have a website that really um, opens that up and allows people to understand how to connect with us to join our educational webinars. So where do we go from here? I mean, I just think Canada is really uh, ripe for centers of excellence. I always say to colleagues when they say, how did you do it? I said, you know, we're, we're big, but we're also small in the sense that we, I think, get along. We want to collaborate. We put, you know, sometimes egos aside just to get things done. And I think that's what's really special about Canada. And I would just like to really leverage our Canadiana as we go forward, which is a real collaborative spirit and work together in order to continue these kinds of efforts. And just really excited to be part of the dialogue as we bring that forward. So thanks, Durheen. No, oh, thank you, Leanne. And exactly what we're saying, right? We can take advantage of what is Canadian but also the Canadian culture. And I think you said it as well, which I always say, not to be pejorative about anybody else, but you know, our Canadian clinicians and researchers are naturally collaborators. There's not the competition. There's not that sense of you know, me or mine, but it really is. And it, even in terms of all the sharing, as you say, I think this is essential. So thank you so very much, as you say, taking the step from what you started with, but also taking it, you know, candle wide and international. And I'm gonna ask Sarah for one more indulgence because I'd like to slide Craig in here, if you don't mind, Craig, and to talk to us about what you're already doing in the neuromuscular space, but also I really like to have you talk a little bit about your vision. Durhain, if Craig is not here, I, I think he was hoping I might cover for him because he had okay. to go see a clinic patient. Oh, well, what's the matter with people? I mean, good gosh, you guys got to kind of stage your patients better. I had somebody somebody else that said, well, I'll come if my patient doesn't show up. Then what's the matter with you? <laughs> no, I'm only kidding. Thank you so much, Jim, for being able to do this. Yeah, if you could. Sure. Me. Craig gave me a few slides. So let me okay. uh, do this. Um just introduce Jim, who is, you're sick kids. Uh, I'm Jim Dowling. I'm a clinician scientist, pediatric neurologist at yeah. sick kids um, with a long-standing interest in uh, diagnostics and therapy development for rare disease. Um, and um, I will quickly talk as a, another example of a Canadian-wide network um, about our uh, CIHR-funded uh, neuromuscular network, the um, NMD4C, which is a collaborative Canadian neuromuscular network. Uh, and Craig gives his apologies. He might jump back in while we're talking. Um, so just to give a quick overview of NMD4C. So it's a pan-Canadian network um, designed to represent uh, really hopefully all of the key stakeholders for neuromuscular disease uh, in Canada, including clinicians, researchers, trainees, uh, patients, families, advocates, um, and, as well as allied health, um, I should mention. 
Um, and uh, the goal is to create a, a sustainable network, um, both from a clinical care perspective, from a um, clinical therapy development perspective, a research uh, net, um, uh, related network, as well as current care standards. Um, we're finishing our first uh, cycle, uh, um, and uh, I think we, we, we feel we've been quite successful in our initial goals. Um, in terms of uh, both establishing this network. And I should mention it was based off of uh, existing uh, interactions um, and networks that um, had previously been in place uh, for neuromuscular disease. Uh, one of the key elements of the network is a partnership with patient organizations. Um, and we have a very strong alliance, um, including uh, membership on the steering committee um, and really just being integrated across all the different pillars of the network um, with patient organizations, including Muscular Dystrophy Canada and Defeat Duchenne, who are really the two big uh, groups that um, participate in the program. Uh, and I think um, that alliance is really uh, makes our network very powerful in terms of its ability to deliver on the goal um, of improving care for individuals with neuromuscular disease. Um, one of the other key elements of it is our the national registry that we have, uh, and this again was something that was in place prior to NMD4C, but I think in, uh, reinforces what's already been mentioned about how, as a country, we have a unique opportunity uh, to be networked um, and to have uh, participation uh, with enrollment across the whole country. And so, the CNDR has been extremely successful um, as a neuromuscular network and as a registry. Um, and uh, there are, I think, what, yeah, 36 sites across the country, really representing pretty much every center that sees neuromuscular patients, um, uh, both adult and pediatrics. Uh, we have over 4,600 uh, individual patients in the registry. And um, as on the next slide, you can see, it's been very heavily utilized, both from an academic project perspective, but also from an industry uh, sponsored project perspective. Um, so one of the initiatives that we're still moving forward, and I think this aligns very nicely with the thoughts of a rare disease, uh, centers of excellence and a rare disease research network, uh, is to really operationalize our clinical trial sites um, with the hope eventually of being, in a way, kind of a single site, uh, you know, representing Canada as neuromuscular disease clinical research um, so that either academics or industry sponsors can come and say, yes, we want to do a clinical trial in Canada. And then uh, it, it goes from there. Um, as part of that, we've established this uh, concierge service, which is a, a dedicated individual who's helping uh, with key stakeholders in terms of aligning um, for new trials, giving information about existing trials, and also starting to work on this um, uh, harmonization across the different sites. Uh, and I think it was already mentioned uh, related to the possibility of um, harmonized REB uh, this is something we've certainly taken advantage of in Ontario with the CTO uh, and the network, the registry itself uh, has used a common uh, uh, REB platform across the different provinces. So I think it gives some precedent of how this can be done across different provinces. Um, the other thing that we are involved in is the care and trial site registry. Um, and this is a, a really neuromuscular focused effort with the idea being to try to get registry level information about sites across the world um, for clinical trial readiness uh, and hopefully for implementation. So the idea being, you know, for example, let's say you're doing a trial on uh, a rare myopathy and you want to know where patients are uh, across, the, across the world to run your trial, this, the CTSR is a way in which one can have access to that kind of information. Um, so um, I will... Um, conclude with just mentioning how the um, we've really made some progress in terms of the clinical trials. Uh, we've both gotten, again, academic and industry sponsored trials that have been uh, seen as success stories through uh, the NMD4C and with the clinical trial network uh, that we're uh, growing and developing. And I think I can end with that. Uh, and again, I think uh, to emphasize uh, all that, I should mention that the study, the network in general has been led by Hans Lockmuller uh, in Ottawa, and it's really represents uh, uh, you know a real collaborative uh, effort across all the sites across the across the country, and as well as the uh, patient and advocacy groups um, all working together. So I guess I will pass it back over.
Yeah, thank you so much, Jim. That was again very, very comprehensive, and I'm sure that um, you know you did Craig Froud in terms of <laughs> the breadth of what you were able to present here. But I think again, it goes back to saying, you know, we have so much examples of the excellence that's taking place now. And some of our goals obviously is to be able to harness that and then be able to leverage that into the networks. And now I would really, thank you so much, Sarah. I'd Sarah Talak Tellerico, who is here with us um, from uh, Italy, who is going to speak to us about the European reference networks and also an example of the um, uh, new muscular network that she actually leads. Um, Sarah, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for hanging in while we kind of went through some of our models here. I don't mean to just keep rushing from one presentation to the other, but there is so much that is valuable here. And it really has been, uh, the rheumatology unit, sorry, that has been so much, um, I think, a value for us to be able to learn internationally as well as to be able to share. So again, thank you so much, Sarah, for doing this. And I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, giving me the possibility to bring to you the experience of the ERN together with Domenica Tarbuscio. Uh, I'm Rosaria Tararico, even if uh, friends call me Sarah, and I'm a rheumatologist and I work in the ERN Reconnect as scientific coordinator. Um, from what I um, listened so far and, and catch from your messages, I'm sorry for uh, connecting late, but I was joining another meeting, but many messages I have listened are very interesting since uh, um, are strongly related to what, what the ERN are. Um, some thoughts, general thoughts that you are uh, were discussing so far, we know that the context of the ERN is the context, the framework in which many other um, countries uh, have the similar problem. We, we know that rare disease have no access in uh, uh, all the countries to the diagnosis and the very early diagnosis. We know that rare disease uh, are characterized by um, a scarce knowledge, scarce evidence, and we know, and the Commission knows, and this is the reason why the Commission has launched the ERN, that no country alone has the possibility and the knowledge to uh, taking care of rare disease, of the whole uh, community of rare disease. For this reason, the ERN uh, have been launched and uh, they are conceived uh, um, uh, just start from what the ERN are, are not. They are not something replicating uh, scientific society. They are not only networks. They are, were, launched, were launched from the European Commission from uh, the point of view of the uh, general view of the rare disease as an infrastructure. And they, after five years of work, uh, we can say that they are an infrastructure, not a project and not, not only a network. Uh, which is the objective of the ERN. Uh, they have been launched um, with the aim of improving quality, safety, access to care, but mainly try to encourage and to work for the equity of care. Since even if many countries are so close, um, we, we know that there are uh, so many differences in terms of access to care from a country. And I'm, I'm speaking from the uh, European countries, but I think that it's so similar for many other countries. Uh, there are many differences in terms of access to care and the barriers to, um, uh, to prescription, to, to, to drugs and many other aspects. So, for this reason, the Commission launched with the um, uh, Directive on Patients' Rights and Cross-Border Care Directive in uh, 2011. And uh, the uh, principle, the big principle of the ERN is that the knowledge travels, not the patients. So the principles of the ERN are share, care, cure. Since we have to share knowledge in different um, centers of excellence, but the centers of, ex of excellence in the framework of a network um, have the duty to improve also the care of the center of not excellence. This is the main mission of the ERN. This is the, the story of the ERN from 
2011 to, uh, uh, to now, uh, 2022, and we have a, a next five years grant in order to improve the, the project of the network. This is the uh, launch, the official launch of the RN in Vilnius in 2017 and what what we can do uh, on ERN mm, uh, the the ERN are characterized by uh, collaboration um, there was a, a a sentence from some one of you uh, saying that Canada is characterized by collaboration uh, big collaboration and not competition this is one of the principles of the ERN since all the expert uh, centers, excellent centers, should be uh, collaborating and cooperating in order to improve the equity of care. And how we can work on equity of care? Only exchanging the expertise and exchanging when needed also uh, clinical data if we have a patient, I'm a rheumatologist, so the example is directly to a rheumatic disease. If we, if we have a patient with lupus in a country, we, we, um, we have to uh, work on a patient, a better care for patients in a country, in Romania and in Spain and also in Italy. This is really equity of care. And actually, uh, at the moment, we do not experience um, a, a very big big equity on uh, all rare, the rare disease. This is the reason why the urn were launched. So network activity also by means of IT tools. Um, the uh, European Commission launched 24 urns and you can see in these slides their names and also the condition that they are taking care. And uh, uh, Reconet is my ERN, and the um, the coordinator, the network coordinator is uh, uh, Professor Marta Mosca. And we are taking care of connective tissue and mu musculoskeletal disease, rare disease, and also complex disease with rare manifestations. This is the picture of our kickoff, but just to say that this is just an example since the 24 ERN are different, but are very similar for many characteristics. Uh, there are different member states, different healthcare providers from the different states and different disease. This is the case of our ERN. We have uh, 10 rare connective tissue disease, um, uh, 55 full members and nine affiliated partners. Partners. Uh, full members are members uh, that are uh, in the, the framework of the VRN as excellent standards by definition uh, with the uh, criteria established also by the European Commission. Um, obviously, centers with a high number of patients followed, the high number of new patients followed, the high expertise demonstrated not only by um, scientific. Uh, publication, but also by scientific collaboration and also by a structure of taking care in the hospital of patients. It is really important. Uh, we have 23 member states represented in the Ernan Reconnect, but again, this is just an example, our examples. And after the second call, since we have a first call in 2017 with, with the launch in the, in, the, in the previous year, uh, 2016, we had uh, 20, um, 20, um, 25 members. After the second call in the last year, we have now 64 HCPs and they are all excellent centers from the different countries. These are the 10 diseases that we are covering, but probably um, we will um, include also other diseases in the future, but these are the 10 diseases on which we are working. Um, what I'm, I, I would like to highlight is the activities that just an example in the Reconnect, uh, since I, I work from the scientific point of view in the activities, but just an example of what all the ERN can do. Um, I have to say that working in the last five years in the uh, in Reconnect, 
I can say that is a, a very big opportunity to have the ERN, to have infrastructure for rare disease. And um, please consider that uh, all of us are involved and also we were involved before the creation of ERN in other scientific society, project, activity and network. So uh, the, the ERN are not, um, are not a new network that are replicating other networks is something, an infrastructure that is including other, many other networks and improve the action of the other networks. So all the activities in an ERN are focused on working on equity of care and working on equity of care from the clinical point of view means also working on clinical practice guidelines on the organization activity, on patient care pathways, on research, on registry, in order to perform a snapshot of the rare disease from the epidemiological point of view. We know that there are a lot of registries for rare disease. In, in many cases, not so much, but for many diseases, a lot of registry. And the registry of DRN are something uh, that are in, implementing all the other registry and data set in order to uh, improve also the other registry and also education and training. Uh, I have to say that working on clinical practice guidelines in ERN is important, not only for producing new clinical practice guidelines. This is the work also of scientific society. The work of a ERN uh, with expert on rare disease is to uh, improve the flexibility, the adaptability of something that we have in order to be applied in a in an easier way in the different countries. This is the case for clinical practice guidelines since we are working, for example, on the adaptation on clinical practice guidelines. There is a specific methodology called the ADAPT that can ensure the adaptation of a clinical practice guidelines to the different geographical and cultural contexts. And this is mandatory for a RERN. There is, it is something that only an infrastructure with different experts and excellent center can do, not only a scientific society. So the perspective of the ERN is to try to improve, um, improve the people and centers that are at excellence, but first of all, improve centers that want to be excellent. And only in this case, we can improve the care for patients. This is the case also for research, try to encourage research in the different countries and collecting um, data from the different countries. But another, another case scenario is to work on patient care pathways. Um, we, were, we are working on a specific methodology that is called a DREDEN path, a methodology created in the framework of the URN uh, in order to try to translate the excellence, the excellence of the excellent centers in the local, integrating uh, at the local level. Only in this way, the infrastructure can, um, can really do the difference. And we are experiencing that in the framework of the ERN, we are really changing the work of rare disease in Europe, obviously, but we are changing something since we are working with patients and patients are working with us at the same level since we, we are co-designing research activity, we are co-designing clinical practice guidelines, but also many other education activity in order to disseminate. It, 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 this is one of the principles of the URN, an infrastructure with a patient-centered approach in a, in a very, uh, really uh, patient-centered approach, since patients in the discussions are uh, like, um, I, I can say, like researcher in the, in the field of rare disease. And we, we may obviously include all the perspective of patients and perspective of patients from different countries in Europe and different cultural and barriered countries is very, very important. This is why uh, we are very happy to work in the year end. This is the picture of, of our EPACs, representative of patient associations. 
they are working with us in uh, Reconnect. And we have uh, produced many things with patients, uh, many uh, papers disseminating the adaptation, many methodology in order to try to improve organizational care. And during the pandemic, we we apply the methodology to improve the organization since we know that during the pandemic, rare disease uh, um, have experienced many difficulties in terms of organization, more than other high prevalence disease. And we are working in a very uh, happy way since we are really changing many, many things. And uh, in, in a context in we, we, we have different networks and you have, as I recently, very uh, collaboration networks in the framework of Canada, uh, the, the, the infrastructure that put together this information and try to improve the different barriers is so, so important. Thank you. I hope I have summarized in a very quickly way, but please, if you have a question or answer, I, I can give to you. Thank you so very much, Sarah. I'm so sorry that we had to actually rush you through this because obviously you're condensing for us about 10 years of experience and, uh, and, and development over a very short period of time. But also, I love what you ended with, and that is with the EPEX. You know, I've seen firsthand the engagement of these patient organizations and how much serious you know, engagement there is and how much respect there is. But I also will say, and this is for our patient members, these e members go through a lot of training. They are absolutely taken through a lot of development in order for them to actually be able to contribute. So a real credit to the ERNs as well in terms of the vision of not only including patients, but doing the development there, which is brilliant. So thank you again very much. I'm hoping that we can count on you folks as we go forth in June, because I really would love to us to be able to take what we've kind of started with here. I will say for the webinars, what I said for our, all of our other webinars, these are what I call conversation starters. We wanted to bring it together. And in many cases, they have been sort of really pushing information and trying to get a, you know, a, the ability to kind of share and get people on the same page. And June, we hope that we'll have better time to actually do some planning with very much the, uh, the different areas. But I think obviously beyond June, I really, you know, I think we've all seen here, the centers of excellence are absolutely the linchpin to our being able to move forth in terms of strategy. And we've seen from now, from the global perspective, from the Nord perspective, from certainly the European perspective, the kinds of roles that these networks actually do play and how effective they can be once they've actually been set up. There's lots of questions that are in here um, in the chat, which I'm, unfortunately we're not gonna be able to get to given the time. And I know that with many of the clinicians, we've actually begged to borrow and, and taken a lot of your time already um, from your, your practice. And so I don't want to keep people, but I do know that Matt will be here with us um, in June. He's agreed to come back. Dominica, I think you're on. Can I get you to just say hello? Yes, make... yes, I'm on. Yeah, I'm hello. on. And, uh, um, hello, my, my friend. And my friend, and oh, hello to all um, all colleagues and friends, too. So I'm pleased to, to participate to this really interesting meeting. The congratulations. And Sarah presented uh, um, what we want to, to, to present, because you asked the European Reference Network perspective. So she... Um, made uh, a brilliant presentation and uh, we are working very well together since many many years so i think that we can really be in uh, uh, with you if you like and uh, share our experiences yeah thank you very much and i think sarah was a great choice because she not only gave us the overview of the erns but she was able to drill down into a very specific network that she is absolutely the scientific director right. of the expertise and, and the show and i know you only showed a very small bit in terms of what they do so i'm hoping that um you know people are aware of, we will make sure that we collect all the slides and make them available to everybody so that we will have them you know certainly for your um reference 
we are absolutely putting together kind of what the format might be in terms of June, where we can have a lot more, you know, that's why I said I wanted to do the presentation so that when we get to June and we're all there together, hopefully as many of you as possible, that we can really engage, that we can really plan and develop as opposed to saying, okay, let's start, you know, with just the, um, you know, the content. We will provide a high level in terms of content, but we really want to get people to roll up their sleeves and start to work. And we really want to, you know, my vision is that we will be able to present, not just to Health Canada, but to the provinces as well, um, to all who are, you know, CHR, you know, um, Genome Canada, but others who are potential real leads for us here, a, a an integrated program, and I like the comment that came up in the uh, in the discussions that what we're really looking for, I think Bill said it, is integration as opposed to a, a leg on. Bill, I'm going to turn it over to you to actually close this out because you've been really the one that's been uh, really following up in terms of the chat. Anything else you've seen there? Anything that we want to bring in together for the uh, closing here? Uh, just to say that this was a, a terrific discussion. Um, the one thing that jumped out at me in terms of how to visualize this is that the networks are like the roads, the, the medicines are like the cars. We need to get the cars to the patients. Um, it's, it, it's not very useful to just talk about the car. We gotta be able to get it to the people who need it. And uh, honestly, it was so much happening in Canada. What you're imagining, Durhan, is actually, here's the map of Canada and how we actually get, get it to patients. And it's happening in the US, it's happening in Europe, it's actually happening in Canada. And CORD is just tying it all together. And, and I hope to see you all, or many of you in person in Ottawa in June. And I think that that's, that's my uh, takeaway in terms of uh, what, what I heard. Perfect, thank you. And thank you for continuing the conversation here for everybody. As we said, it was a lot of information, but a lot of great information sharing. And, you know, obviously we're not gonna be able to con even conclude this with one meeting. I'm hoping that people will be willing and we're gonna send out a, a request for expressions of interest. We would love to have a core steering group for our centers of excellence. If people, you know, I mean, I'll send it out to everybody who was invited, who might've been also not able to, to join us, but also those here. We need to have that planning group. Court is certainly willing to try to help sponsor this as we move forward. But obviously, you know, what we want to do is to make sure it's well integrated, as you've said, into our systems. I will say, I don't think I'm telling Charles out of school, we've been meeting with the provincial health systems at the same time. So with the ministries there to really kind of explore kind of what our vision is in terms of this rare disease uh, system. But you're the ones working there that are going to have the biggest influence in terms of being able to say, hey, yes, this is where we want to be. This is where we can need to be. And I think Leanne said it very strongly at the beginning. You know, we do have the ability. We're a big country, but really small in terms of the connections that already exist. I always say Canada is kind of like the perfect country. You know, it's big enough that we can have a lot of expertise. We can have a lot of experts. We can have a lot of centers and clinics, but we're also small enough that people know each other and they work naturally well with each other. And we reach out to each other. And we're also a very nice country. I think, you know, the philosophy around Canada is what Sarah says, you know, in terms of the equity, in terms of the ability to really think about how do we engage everybody. So, you know, I think we're the very perfect, you know, proving ground. So in some respects, we got a lot of catch up to do. Um, and we thank Nord and we thank um, Matt at the global level and certainly to Sarah and Dominica for helping us understand kind of what else is out there. But I kind of feel and I put this re really strongly, I think Canada can be the very best. So, you know, Matt, I'm putting this out for you, you know, as you're putting together these centers of excellence, we actually want to be the center of excellence, you know, that can be, you know, that amazing model, because we've kind of borrowed from everybody else's experience, and we're going to get the best of, but we're also such a nice country to begin with. I think we can do this really, really well, and we can take advantage of, you know, what the federal government has had, but I think what the provinces also want, and that is to do, you know, the best we can. So I hear people also saying to me all the time, how we're going to do this with COVID, and where's the money? coming from because the provinces are so focused on COVID. And what we need to be clear is that if we do this right, we will save you buckets of money down the road. We will save you buckets in terms of patient lives. We will absolutely be that number one return on investment. I mean, the statistic I threw out there earlier, $111 billion we're spending in terms of rare diseases already, and we're not getting a whole lot for it. So we might need to spend 121 billion. What do I know? 
but we actually will get everything for it. So thanks to everybody who was here. And uh, really, we look forward to you next time. And really, especially thank you, Dominica, for jumping on with us as well. And Matt as well for coming in. And also to Pam and uh, to Mary Beth from Noah. Thank you guys very, very much. We'll see you thank next you time around. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.